Hey guys, I'm Eddie Joe, and today's video is going to be on this JAMA article that was published on October 24th, 2018. Today, just for sake of reference, is November 6th, 2018. And this article is, is titled, The Effect of a Low versus Intermediate Tidal Volume Strategy on Ventilator-Free Days in, in the Intensive Care Unit Patients Without ARDS. Now, to introduce myself, my name is Eddie Joe, and I'm an intensivist. These videos are for educational and nerdy entertainment purposes only and are not recommendations on how to manage your patients. Please read this, these articles yourself. I've actually chosen this article because A, it's pretty important and second, it's free. But don't trust me on what I say. Read the articles for yourself. You've been warned. Now, if you learned something from this video, please click the like button and subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks in advance for checking out my video. I'm trying to get better at this every day. Hopefully this is better than the last Journal Club-ish one I did on the sub-ICU trial. And I'm also on Instagram and Twitter if you're into those types of things. Let's go ahead and get started. First is a personal introduction as to why this article is important to me. is because we've learned so much about using low tidal volume as a lung, product, lung protective strategy for ventilators in the ICU that we've kind of sort of maybe have extrapolated that data a little bit too far. And what that means is that and just to give you an example, where I did my fellowship where I trained, we had a, a morning huddle every day with a little checklist. And amongst the things that would be on the checklist would be a question that states, are all your patients on low tidal volume ventilation? And if you had somebody who by some chance was on 8 cc's per kilogram of ideal body weight for, for their vent setting, well, then you got this dirty look like, hey, you need to fix that. So then this particular study <laughs> kind of negates all that, and let's go ahead and talk about it. First of all, the key points that that's basically being addressed here, it states, and I don't know if you can read this on your phone or your iPad, but I'm going to go ahead and click along with it. It states, in patients in the intensive care unit who received invasive ventilation for reasons other than ARDS, is a ventilation strategy with low tidal volume more effective than a strategy using intermediate tidal volume with respect to number of ventilator-free days and alive at, tw at day 28? So what it states here is that the findings are, and this is obviously a spoiler alert, in this randomized clinical trial that included 961 patients, which honestly, as an aside, is a good amount of patients for a study of this nature, in the ICU who are receiving invasive ventilation and expected to not be extubated within 24 hours of randomization, i.e. no non-aspirating op opioid overdoses on this, a ventilation strategy with low tidal volume did not result in a significant difference in ventilator-free days and the life at day 28 than a ventilation strategy with an intermediate tidal volumes. Okay, so I'm not going to go through the abstract because we have access to the whole entire article, and that's a darn good thing. Once again, thank you, JAMA. Talking about the introduction, it states, invasive ventilation, one of the most frequently applied strategies in the ICU, in other words, most people come to the unit because they're on a vet, is increasingly recognized as a potential harmful inter intervention. And I agree with this wholeheartedly. I mean, I do not, I try my best to avoid extubating, excuse me, intubating people unless they absolutely need it. And then it states that there's evidence that lung protect protective ventilation using low tidal volume improves survival in patients with ARDS. This is something that, you know, it's been around almost for, uh, 16, 17 years now, we've known this, perhaps even more at this time, and this is kind of standard of care. And this, But this is the kicker, which is the next sentence right here, it says, but it is less certain whether tidal volume restriction benefits patients without ARDS. And to go along with what I, excuse me, I almost dropped my iPad on me, with what I said previously, we've been extrapolating the data of using low tidal volumes in patients who have ARDS to patients who do not have ARDS states that two randomized clinical trials found that tidal volume reduction to be associated with a lower number of pulmonary complications in patients without ARDS, and two individual patient data meta-analyses suggest that tidal volume reduction may shorten the time on the ventilator and duration of ICU, excuse me, of stay in the ICU in the hospital. However, the use of low tidal volumes can lead to an increased need for sedation, which is something that we're working extremely hard to cut down on right now, especially with this opioid epidemic and who knows what type of, uh, how we have contributed to this ourselves as clinicians because of higher respiratory rate or patient ventilator asynchrony. And if I'm going to be completely honest with you, um, I do not see much, uh, many problems with regards to high respiratory rate because of 6 cc's per kilogram of ideal body weight. But I guess if I had people 
on eight cc's per kilogram of ideal body weight, maybe they won't have these issues. And then it continues to say, and possibly self-inflicted lung injury due to compensatory injurious inspiratory efforts. In addition, it has been suggested that low tidal volumes may increase the risk of delirium. I gotta find the citation for number 13, actually. I'm gonna click over here, put it on the side, and I'm gonna read that later because that one's pretty important to me. So the PREVENT trial, which is the sexy name for this particular trial, uh, stands for Protective Ventilation in Patients Without ARDS, was conducted to test whether a ventilation strategy using low tidal volumes is superior to a ventilation strategy using intermediate tidal volumes with respect to a number of ventilator-free days and alive at day 28. So that's, that's what we're going to be doing here. Well, not me, but, you know, the people who designed this trial. Starting off with the methods with regards to the study design and oversight, this is a randomized clinical trial conducted in the ICU of six hospitals in the Netherlands. Six hospitals, a good amount of hospitals for a study like this, all in one country, so you would figure that they all kind of practice the same way in the Netherlands. I always do suggest, if you really want to get into these articles, to read these different supplements because they offer, they offer a lot of juicy information that you might not otherwise see listed on the actual article itself. With regards to the patients, well, kind of talks about the patients who were included in the study. They were randomized within one hour of initiation of ventilation in the ICU. Different exclusion criteria include you know, ARDS, obviously. They randomized patients one-on-one -on -one ratio to a low or intermediate tidal volume ventilation strategy, et cetera, et cetera. And here is where we get to the sexy part, the interventions. Patients who were assigned to a low tidal volume group started a tidal volume of 60 cc's per kilogram of ideal or predicted body weight, either volume controlled or pressure support ventilation. Then the tidal volume was decreased by one cc of kilogram one cc per kilogram of ideal body weight every hour to a minimum of four. With pressure support ventilation, the lowest level of pressure support was used to reach the target volume with a minimal minimum of five cc's. Excuse me, five centimeters of water. Now, if they saw that the tidal volume increased to more than eight cc's per kilogram of ideal body weight with minimum pressure support, this was to be accepted. Okay. They also state that in cases of severe dyspnea, including levels of, excuse me, increasing levels of discomfort with or without the need for more sedation, a respiratory rate of higher than 35, uncontrollable acidosis, or patient ventilator asynchrony, the tidal volume could be increased in increments of one cc per kilogram, one cc per kilogram of ideal body weight per hour in patients receiving volume controlled or pressure support ventilation. Okay, this is all in the this is all in the supplement. Now, if the patients were assigned to the intermediate tidal volume group, they were started at 10 cc's per kilogram of ideal body weight using a volume controlled ventilation mode. These people were not on pressure control or pressure support for that matter. If the plateau pressure was greater than 25 cc's of water, the tidal volume was decreased in increments of one cc per kilogram of ideal body weight per hour. And the people who had pressure support ventilation, the pressure support level was adjusted to reach the target tidal volume while keeping the max maximum airway pressure less than 25 cc, 25 centimeters of water. The ventilator settings were checked at least every eight hours each day and were, if necessary, readjusted according to the protocol. I honestly look at my own ventilator settings uh, on patients who are sick and who I'm, you know, managing actively far more often than eight hours, every eight hours, excuse me. This little fact here is pretty darn important. They did not permit the additional use of anal sedation or muscle relaxants so that the patients would adhere to their assigned ventilation strategy. This is pretty important because they let the patients behave how they were supposed to behave. Continuing on standard, standard care, uh, strict local clinical guidelines, this supplement, all these supplements are pretty, pretty interesting. Um, you should definitely look into them if you're really interested in this study. With regards to waiting for the ventilator, I'll let you read this yourself uh, because this is kind of their institution, how they chose to do it. And now let's talk about outcomes. There is a lot to be read here, but for the sake of not boring you, it states that the primary outcome was the number of ventilator-free days and alive at day 28, defined as the number of days that a patient was alive and free from invasive ventilation calculated from the moment of randomization if the period of unassisting, unassisted breathing lasted longer than 24 consecutive hours. Then it talks about patients who were intubated, extubated, etc., etc., how they calculated the days, yada, yada, yada. Secondary outcomes included ICU and hospital length of stay, ICU, hospital, 
and 28 and 90 day mortality and the occurrence of pulmonary complications including the development of new ARDS, ventilator associated pneumonia, severe atelectasis and pneumothorax. They also state that mortality at day 28 was not included as a secondary outcome in the original protocol but was subsequently added in the updated protocol and statistical analysis plan. Other things that they looked at as secondary outcomes were the amount of sedatives prescribed, the use of analgesics and neuromuscular blocking agent, the transfusion of blood products need for decreasing dead space, and the occurrence of delirium. They had other study parameters including healthcare related costs, uh, regarding cost of ventilation, and I think they're probably going to end up publishing a different study with keeping that in mind. They did statistical analysis, which I'm never going to get into in these particular videos because I am not an expert at this. So now let's talk about the results. This is one of the reasons why I do not do academic medicine and why I don't do research. These folks, these fine folks who went ahead and did this study, um, basically had three years where they screened almost 3,700 patients. Of those, 2,700 for, you know, a couple more were not enrolled, of whom 961 met the exclusion criteria and 1,773 patients were eligible but not enrolled for other reasons. Now, of the 961 patients who were randomized, who were enrolled in the study, excuse me, 477 were in the low tidal volume group and 484 were in the intermediate tidal volume group. That's a lot of patients. They talk about their intervention, about when they started ventilation and randomization was 0.88 hours, median time between start of ventilation, IC randomization, etc. Okay, you can read that on your own. The outcomes basically states here that Patients in both groups had a median of 21 ventilator free days with a p value of 0.71, no difference. And results of the analysis with stratification variables as random effect is consistent with results of the primary analysis. Also states that the median length of ICU and hospital stay, ICU and, and hospital mortality rates, and mortality at 20 and 90 days were not different between the groups. Very important stuff. Also, the occurrence of ARDS, pneumonia, severe atelectasis, and pneumothorax did not significantly differ between the groups. There was no difference between groups with respect to the need for, duration of, and amount of sedatives, analgesics, and neuromuscular blocking agents, or the development of delirium. So that whole component that having low tidal volume gives patients delirium, that's not accurate. Other things that you can see more more in depth in the whole supplement in the whole supplement as well as in the tables shows that the fluid balance, transfusion of blood products, and the use of recruitment maneuvers and other rescue therapies for impairment of gas exchange did not differ between the two groups. Very important little paragraph here. Okay, so now let's move to the discussion. Just recapitulating what I said a little bit earlier in this trial, well not what I said, what I read, because I didn't write this journal article. In this trial of adult patients in the ICU without ARDS who received invasive ventilation were expected to not be extubated within 24 hours of randomization, a ventilation strategy using low tidal volume was not more effective than a strategy using intermediate tidal volume with respect to the number of ventilator-free days and alive at day 28. In addition, there was not a difference in the length of stay, mortality, or in the occurrence of pulmonary complications between the groups. The low tidal volume strategy was associated with respiratory acidosis. Big, big deal here, guys. Big deal. Um, basically, let's keep on cruising because all this stuff is stuff that you could read and you just want the important stuff. And here they discuss the limitations. I always like to uh, note the limitations in the study because this shows the awareness of the authors to be forthcoming with, obviously, their limitations. Six the first, blinding was not possible because of the nature of the intervention which could be a major concern. Of course, like I need to know what my ventilator set at so that I can manage my patients. There would be no way in God's green earth that you can do a study on ventilators and blind people to say respiratory rate or, you know, basically any other parameters that we set up on the ventilator. Now it says that attending nurses and physicians did not show specific interest in the trial or its primary outcome and there were no differences in respiratory care, sedation practice and rusty therapies. It also states the second, a heterogeneous group of patients without ARDS was, in, was included, but a sub-analysis of two important groups, patients with pneumonia and sepsis, did not reveal interaction. 
Third, a substantial number of patients was missed for randomization, which was an understandable consequence of the short time that was allowed for randomization. Remember, they had to get these people, as soon as they got on the ventilator, one hour to be randomized. That's pretty, that's pretty darn quick, which honestly could be considered a strength of the study, but you know that did lead them to miss out on, on other patients. Fourth, although the intervention was able to randomize patients within one hour after the start of ventilation in the ICU, randomization at this time was in some cases unpractical or impossible. Still, the majority of patients were randomized within one hour, which is a relatively short period compared to the duration of ventilation after randomization. Fifth, these data do not exclude potential harm from, high, from tidal volumes higher or lower than the ones used in the present trial. And in conclusion, as I've kind of beat you over the head with it, in patients in the ICU without ARDS who were expected to not be extubated within 24 hours, a low tidal volume strategy did not result in a greater number of ventilator free days compared with an intermediate tidal volume strategy. All in all, that was this particular study. Please check out the supplements. Let me see if I can move the screen over here. Boop. Where, uh, let me see if I can open this guy right here. Mm, maybe not. Anyway, hope you guys enjoyed this video, learned something from this particular format. I hope JAMA doesn't get mad at me for using their article. Anyway, thanks a lot. Have a great day. Take care. Bye.